Hello and welcome to this HDB webinar examining the impact of uh, examining the, the impact of exiting the EU on the ornamentals industry. I'm Wayne Brough, HDB Knowledge Exchange Manager, and in this, the first of two webinars, we explore the impact on trade agreements, plant movement, and plant passporting. Before I uh, introduce today's programme and speakers, uh, just a few housekeeping points to cover. As you'll see, uh, the audience is on mute throughout but you can pose questions and I'll come back to that in a moment. The webinar itself will last about uh, an hour and a half, including 30 minutes question and answer session at the end. It will be recorded, so if you do need to leave or if you need to pass it on to colleagues, it will be available later on the HDB website. Uh, there is a handout available with this and I'll, I'll, I'll uh, explain how to download this in a moment, uh, but it covers all the slides presented in today's webinar and you should have received a basis uh, form if you are collecting points from Heather and you sh uh, hopefully you've submitted the, uh, the information back to Heather to, to uh, uh, acquire the points. As I said, in terms of questions, handouts and, and accessing things generally, you should have something resembling uh, this uh, functionality, the GoToWebinar functionality in the top right hand corner. Uh, if you need to minimize uh, the menu, click the red button with the white arrow. But before you do so, uh, just a couple of things to highlight. Uh, there's a gray bar there which says handouts. So if you want to access the handouts, click the bar and then uh, from the drop down menu, select the handout and you can download the handout uh, at any point during today's webinar. If you'd like to pose questions and please do pose questions throughout, don't, don't leave questions till the very uh, end for the Q&A. Uh, I will keep an eye on them and I will pose them at the end. Uh, again, click the, the grey bar which says questions and then type in um, the actual question you want to submit and then hit submit and, and I will keep an eye as, on, on them as they come in. And as I said before, the recording will be made available uh, hopefully uh, later this week or next week on the HDB website. So today's uh, webinar programme, we uh, kick off with Sarah talking about uh, key changes in the trading relationship resulting from the EU exit. Then followed by uh, Diane talking uh, about a grow perspective on importing plants and bulbs. And then we move to Victoria and Jason uh, giving a summary about moving plants, plant products and plant passporting between EU uh, and, and the UK. As I say, followed, followed, uh, following this, there will be a 30 minute question and answer session where we'll be joined by Louise Green of DEFRA, Guy Nettleton and Ed Birchill from AFA to take questions uh, in an extended question and answer session. Before we commence, just to say a few things about today's presenters. Uh, Sarah is a Senior Strategic Insight Manager in the HDB Market Intelligence team. Uh, Diane is a partner in J.A. Collison & Son. Uh, if you don't know the business, it's a family-run business growing about 35 million cut flower stems per year, including tulips, stocks, uh, asters and lilies. And then in terms of DEFRA and AFRA, uh, we've got Victoria and Jason. Uh, Victoria is from the Plants Import Policy uh, uh, Division and Jason is from the Exports uh, Lead Plant Health uh, um, Policy Team. Uh, Victoria and Jason will be giving the presentation today and then during the question and answer session we'll be joined by Louise, uh, Guy and, and Ed. Uh, Louise is from the uh, DEFRA Plant Health Policy and, and both Guy and, and, and Ed are both plant health seed inspectors with, with AFA. Uh, so, without, without, so without further ado, if I pass over now to, uh, to, to our first presenter, Sarah, and she'll be talking about the trade agreements uh, following the EU exit. So thank you. Thank you, Wayne, and uh, thank you very much for that introduction. Um, I'm now going to share my screen. So um, you should all be able to, to see my slides now. So um, as Wayne said, uh, I'm the strategic Insight Manager with HDB and as an economist it's been my job over the last uh, four and a half years to really delve into the EU exit and examine all the potential impacts of, uh, of that exit and it's taken us on on quite a journey and it definitely took us up to the wire so I think when we did um, strike that deal on on Christmas Eve I think most of the industry um, breathed a huge sigh of relief uh, and, and we can't take it away from the negotiators that managing to secure a tariff um, and uh, TRQ free access to EU markets and vice versa was a was a huge achievement in the time that they had available. However, it's really, really important to remember that we, we we've left the single market, we've left the EU stating the obvious, but that 
that means that it's absolutely not business as usual. I think the misconception once we, we struck this free trader agreement was that there would be very little change. Um, but there is a great deal of change as we're finding out in these early months of, uh, uh, of post-EU membership. And I want to really sort of draw out the the key differences in in trading as a third country so uh, as i say the the tariff and quota free access is very unusual for a free trade agreement and and we have a a lot to thank sort of our previous trading relationship and and the hard work of the the teams to to access that but we are now a third country and that involves trade friction. So this this trade friction, if you like, involves the the actual logistical movements, the the, the plant health certification, the extra paperwork, um, the the third country equivalents, um, and the technical issues and the physical inspections that happen at ports. And that's without the the sort of held, held ups that happened in the very early days that, that were partially down to COVID. So this trade friction in, in horticulture in particular, um, the uh, the fact that, that so many of the shipments are perishable and any sort of time delay can, can really add cost and devalue loads. Uh, and so this can't be underestimated and we will have several speakers sort of outlining exactly what that looks like for their business. Certain issues uh, still remain. So this third country equivalence, we now have to negotiate that uh, that our sanitary and phytosanitary standards are um, of, uh, of equivalence to the to the EU. I think again there was there was thinking when we struck this free trade deal that that would be almost a technicality and the music would be good and that would be sort of fairly plain sailing. But we've seen from the issue around sea potatoes that that's not necessarily the case. We can't take that for granted, um, and therefore they may well be be uh, more bumps in the road ahead uh, on that equivalence issue. The autonomy. So the UK and the EU can set their own regulations, um, but as I say, the exporter needs to meet the importer requirements, and that's a really, really important point. And as we move further away uh, from the, uh, the the EU regulations, we can expect uh, the the creation of more barriers, if you like, to that trade. So as we move away from EU equivalents, we haven't agreed this dynamic equivalence, and therefore over time we will diverge. Um, and and there's there's nothing to say that the EU won't uh, won't you know um, reimpose some sort of tariff barrier at that stage. The rules of origin. This is a really really interesting bit for the for the horticultural sector. Um, the rules of origin exist in free trade agreements to make sure that the two parties in the free trade agreements are the beneficiaries of this tariff-free access. Um, it, it, it's meant to exclude any sort of third country product that either comes into the EU or the, or the UK and is, is then traded. So it really states that the product coming in from a third country into the UK can't be exported tariff-free over to the EU, but it also applies to EU products. So if the EU product comes over to the UK, um, it has to be sufficiently processed before it can be re-exported. It can't just come over to a distribution hub in the UK, be, be broken up, repackaged and sent back, or it will be subject to full EU common external tariffs. And that's something that tripped up quite a, a, a few traders in the in the early days but DEFRA have run a, an excellent series of webinars clarifying the the guidance on that and there's also a, a lot of information on the on the website but this really is a steep learning curve we are trading as a third country so we're truly exporting whereas previously we were just moving stuff around within a single market and the level playing field clauses we need to maintain that alignment around labor rights the environment and and the industry uh, policy, the, the subsidies that we, we give to agriculture and horticulture um, in order to maintain that tariff and quota free access. So you can see already there are significant differences to uh, being a member of the, the EU single market. So in the early days, I think a lot of businesses sort of preempted the, the, the teething issues and, and got as much of their trade in in late December as they possibly could, um, given the fact that our, our products are fresh and, and perishable. So 
the trading volumes were down in January um, and, and some loads were, were turned back in the early days as much due to COVID as they were to, to not having the, the right paperwork. Um, but there is some anecdotal evidence, uh, especially around the French ports, that the, the French were embracing the additional bureaucracy with, a, with an enthusiasm that wasn't quite anticipated uh, this side of the channel and therefore they were um, causing some uh, some delays and um, ad additional paperwork and checks. Um, as I say, these are probably trading, uh, probably teething problems. And um, as we get to sort of settle uh, in, into a new normal, in particular, once the grace period, i.e. the fact that the UK is imposing a very light touch on product coming in from the EU, um, once that expires on the 1st of April and the checks will be both ways, um, we, we, will, we expect to see that settling down. But there are some new um, ways of operating and, and these we have to get used to and we have to um, learn to work with. Uh, and they could add additional costs to, to suppliers. And at the moment, I think while suppliers are, are fully committed to just getting the product across or or, or getting the product across to, to the UK or over to the EU um, and making sure that the customers are, are satisfied. I think once the dust settles and they, these new rules um, are really evaluated and companies take a step back. I think that um, the the costings involved uh, need to be calibrated and and uh, incorporated into into their business models. So the rules of origin, as I've explained, are there to determine the economic nationality of a product. So the third country imports can't be um, exported and take advantage of this free free trade deal. Um, there's a 15% tolerance on the rules of origin, but what it does mean, for instance, if you're sending um, bunches of cut flowers across to the EU and some of those flowers are not of UK origin, then you need to be very careful um, that you meet and can prove that you you can meet these rules of origin in order to uh, to avoid those tariffs. So it's complex, but as I say, there's a huge amount of guidance available on the DEFRA website. The non-trade deal, uh, deal issues. Now, um, agricultural policy uh, traditionally has been area-based and therefore of, of uh, very little significance in horticulture. Um, the, the horticulture dependence on, on direct payments is the lowest across all of our, our sectors here at AHDB. Um, but what is important as we transition into ELM, um, the environmental land management uh, schemes, which we will be doing here in England, um, and a, a similar direction of travel in Wales, um, Scotland and Northern Ireland are sort of uh, maintaining the direct payments for uh, at least until 2024, but a, a, a will be changing their devolved policies later on. It's important to explore the potential opportunities that are there for growers because now we're not, we're moving away from this area-based payments and the and the direct payments are, are, are going um, and they will be gone by 2028. Uh, there may well be opportunities and, and the DEFRA guidance is very clear that all farmers and growers should be eligible to join the, uh, the, the sustainable farming initiative, the tier one type payments. So this move away from um, uh, direct payments and towards the public money for public goods, um, it'll be a phased reduction in the first year. We now know the reductions um, uh, into 2024 and they can be calculated. So if you are in receipt of, of any um, uh, direct payments, you can you can use our business impact calculator on the HGB website and see very clearly where your payments will, will be reduced between now and 2028. But as I say, uh, far less significance to horticulture. This is just a sort of broad background slide to tell you what's happening elsewhere in the industry. But what is incredibly important for horticulture, and we knew this right from the beginning, was the uh, the access to labour. The fact that over the last uh, 40 years, we have had access to a, a growing pool of labour as the EU expanded, um, very affordable, um, very, very productive, very highly skilled, although they may ne not necessarily be highly qualified, very, very skilled at what they do. And therefore the potential loss of this labour, I, I think was one of the, the main issues facing our sector. We're going to run a, an entire webinar on this on the on the 19th of March, but just a, a sort of a, a quick view. So um, when we did sort of survey this uh, last, last year, the, the challenges around um, 
uh, around labour were really in the food production plants um, and due to COVID, uh, where people were working in close proximity, either due to staff illness or, or the fact that people had to self-isolate or the fact that they had to keep a physical distance was causing huge problems in, in production. But the horticulture recruitment wasn't as bad as, uh, as many predictions, um, but obviously we hadn't actually fully left uh, then. So it was just the anecdotal evidence we were getting that that, that the workers felt less welcome, if you like, and, um, and were more reluctant. So we had the, the Pick for Britain campaign, um, and, and that was successful in putting a lot of people forward for these jobs. But I have to say that the evidence suggests that they didn't last very long and they didn't sort of stay in the jobs because we all know that it's incredibly hard work. Um, they're antisocial hours. They tend to be out of town locations, so they're not where the main um, population is. Um, and, and as I say, it, it's um, the European workers that come back year after year uh, are, are very skilled and very quick and very efficient at this work. And, and the UK workers took some, some time to come up to speed. So, so there were significant challenges, uh, and not just in horticulture, uh, you know, across across the board. But with the new seasonal workers pilot uh, and the increase in numbers, um, uh, I, I think the, the, the industry is slightly more, more positive. But we are facing now this points-based system. You have to have a, a, an offer of a job, and it has to be at the appropriate skill level. And this is this is defined in my next slide. And you have to be able to speak English at a required level. Um, and then a lot of the education um, requires sort of a degree and PhD in in a relevant subject, particularly these STEM subjects. So obviously that rules out uh, a lot of uh, horticultural pickers. Um, and they have to be of a salary in order to get those maximum points above twenty five thousand pounds. Uh, yes, twenty. £25,000 per, per annum, 25600 Um and if you look at these sort of food sector roles and, and the skill sets, these elementary trades and, and your pickers will only be at level one, along with your processing and, and plant operatives. So they're not going to qualify on a points-based system, um, even though uh, we would argue that they are they are highly skilled. So it has to be in a shortage occupation. Um, it tends to be, it's going to be more likely to be the, the, the managers and proprietors that can qualify on that points-based system and salary um, in order to get those 70 points to, to, to come in unless they come in under the seasonal agricultural workers scheme. So your farm managers and your farmers in skilled horticultural trades might be up at that level three but your, your, your pickers will be down at the level ones and twos. So as I said this has been sort of my main focus for the last four years. Uh, what, what have we done? <clears throat> We've looked very carefully at the potential impact on, on prices and on trade volumes and all that information is available on the website and what will we be doing? Well uh, my main focus is going to be um, uh, really looking at the future trade deals that are coming along. So, so we're proposing uh, trade deals with Australia, with New Zealand and with the US. How will that affect the horticultural sector? Um, how will that uh, affect prices and volumes? Um, so we're modelling that work with Harper Adams University and we'll be preparing a, a number of scenarios and, and a huge amount of information uh, to be made available to the industry in order to help them make informed decisions and prepare for this change. We'll also be creating some sort of uh, model businesses to actually see what it looks like on the on the business income, um, the impact of these these trade deals. And we'll be running a, a series of these these webinars um, uh, and blogs um, and, uh, uh, and and podcasts in can, can in conjunction with our other stakeholders. So there is a wealth of information on the website and all the questions that we get asked in the webinar are taken off and put on the frequently asked question on the EU Brexit page. So I do encourage you, if you don't get a chance to ask your question today, to either type it, type it in, email it into me and we'll make sure that you do get an answer. So going forward, as I say, make sure that you look at our resources and information on the on the Brexit, the EU exit page uh, and keep up to date with the with the latest information. We'll be monitoring things like trade volumes and um, prices going forward to to really start seeing if our predictions of the impact assessment of uh, of leaving the EU are in line with the uh, reality going forward. 
And what next? So uh, that this continued focus on trade and policy analysis will really be drawing out as more information comes of it, becomes available on ELMS exactly where the opportunities are for the sector and how growers can take advantage of, of that. Um, we'll also be uh, continuing to, to, to model the impact on an ongoing basis of any change in our trading relationship, um, any any sort of future trade deals, any um, um, collective like the CPTPP, uh, any collective trade organisations that the UK may join going forward. So there's a huge amount of work going on. We haven't just stopped. Um, because we've we've reached this trade deal, uh, although it's pro probably, in my opinion, the best possible outcome to to that round of negotiations to to have this tariff free access. There's still a huge amount of work to do to really delve into the detail about what that means for each individual sector. And I think our next speakers will be will be sharing a, a huge amount of valuable information on that with you today. Thank you. I will now hand over. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you for that. Uh, just to remind people, if you if you do wish to pose a question to Sarah, please, if you can type it in the question box and we'll pick it up at the end. Uh, but to pass over now to to Diane to sort of uh, give her her own grow perspective on importing plants and bulbs. Thank you, Diane. Sorry, get my screen up here. Okay, hopefully everybody can hear, hear me and see my uh, screen. Um, so yeah, I'm Diane Collison and I'm here today to talk to you about um, importing plants and bulbs from a grower's perspective. So just a little bit uh, about J.A. Collison and Sons. Uh, Wayne explained we're a cut flower producer um, just on the Lincolnshire Norfolk border, producing about 35 million stems of cut flowers per year. Our main uh, customers are supermarkets, the likes of Sainsbury's, M&S, Asda and Waitrose. Uh, but we also supply other customers like Bloom Wild, Next, Co-op, Audi, Tesco's and some local florist trade. Um, we grow a number of seasonal products um, with almost 12 months a year production. Um, and our main crops are tulips, scented stocks, lilies and asters. Just to give an overview of what I was going to talk to you about today, um, we'll talk about the kind of things that we import as a business, uh, what we have done to prepare for Brexit, um, how we deal with the customs, um, what we do day to day or week to week um, to enable uh, the imports to come in, uh, a bit about the peach applications, and then the plant health inspections following that, plant passporting, um, and then about um, what we've done, we've set up a Dutch company called Collison BB to assist with bringing some of our bulbs in and a little bit about what we think is going to happen in the future. So we import all our tulip bulbs, uh, which is about 27 million bulbs. Uh, they come in over 26 weeks uh, with around four deliveries a week from eight different suppliers in Holland. Um, we buy about three and a half million scented stock plants. They come in from a single supplier in Holland uh, with one delivery per week over 17 weeks. And then we also buy our lily bulbs, about one and a half million of those. They come in, come in over 16 weeks. We're up to three deliveries a week from three different suppliers in Holland. So in order to prepare for Brexit, um, we took the decision to try and get some training to understand um, what we needed to do um, if it went to sort of world trade um, regulations. Um, got in touch with our local chamber of commerce who were very helpful and we did some online training to get some background information about the kind of things we needed to, to be doing. We applied for an AORI number um, and that is done on gov.uk. Then after that, we apply to be a, a, a pod, which is a place of destination. Um, so that means that plant health can inspect the products here rather than being inspected at the port. That was a digital form to download and then email back to plant health. We also applied for a duty deferment account. 
um, on gov.uk. It's linked to your EORI number and your company details. And then our customs, our freight forwarders use that so that the duty is deferred and nothing needs to be paid or call. Then finally, once we found out exactly the kind of things that we needed to know and have in place, uh, we emailed, emailed all our suppliers, which are mainly Dutch suppliers, with a list of the key information that they needed to provide when sending each consignment just so that we would try to um, not get any holds up, hold ups at the port. The kind of thing that this thing needs to be included are the company details, INCO terms, their EORI number, the net and gross weights of the consignment, the number of bulbs or plants, the number of cases, the kind of packaging they're in. You have to include our EORI number, the commodity code and the country of origin we were very keen to do was to make sure everybody had everything in place so nothing was held up at the port. So dealing with customs, we work with um, Danmar Logistics, who are based in Ipswich. They're a freight forwarding business um, and they work closely with our haulier, which is Vindhorst BV. Um, just to give you a little back, bit of background, Danmar their cost, to arrange the customs costs in the region of about £35 uh, per consignment. So day to day, um, or week to week really, uh, I deal with it. So each Friday we send an email to our, our haulier with our expected deliveries for the next week. What it is, who it's from, when are we expecting it and, and so on. Um, couple of days prior to the uh, product coming in, um, the suppliers provide us with a pack list, an invoice and a phytosanitary certificate. Then the day before arrival, Vindhorst will provide us with the customs document, the ship and trailer details and an ETA in support. Um, and then we also make a specific CSV file for each consignment, which has to be in a particular format for us to upload onto Peach. So all plant and bulb deliveries need uploading onto the Peach portal. Um, just as an aside, you can get your person who deals with your customs or your freight forwarder to do this for you, but we deal with it ourselves. Um, we're registered to log in onto the portal and then you enter your own details as an importer, the exporter details, the port of entry, the consignment details, packaging, the net weight, price sanitary, upload, scanned um, documents, which is the packing list, the invoice, custom document, and so on. And then you shortly receive back an automated email to confirm the application. Um, then there's a traffic light system in place for each consignment, which starts off red, um, and it turns green once Plant Health cleared it. Um, there may be an inspection or it may happen without the need for a visit. When we started doing this in January, nearly everything went green before it arrived on, on farm. Um, they've now started to inspect a lot more um, and we're finding that all, all, of our, all of our plants for propagating are being inspected, um, but the bulbs um, is not so often. So yeah, the plant health inspector will usually telephone, they usually uh, look on the system and see that the delivery is expected. Um, and then they'll telephone and say, when, when will it, we, we, do we expect to see it on the farm? All they can see is when it comes into port. Um, and we are finding that it's taking quite a while to come from port to, to, to farm. Um, normally last year, uh, a vehicle would be coming out of Felix Stowe at six o'clock in the morning and it would be here by eight or nine o'clock. We're often finding now it's not arriving till mid-afternoon um, and sometimes it can be held up even longer than that. So it's, it's problematic um, trying to liaise with plant health to say when it's here so that they can then come and, come and inspect it. So, you know, we're, we're, we're calling them quite a bit to say, you know, it's here or it's not here or, or whatever. Uh, just a quick note about plant passporting. Um, if plants are moved to another site more than 10 miles away, 
or to another grower or for final sale, then they need to be plant passported. Um, this is something we've, we've just recently done. Um, and you have to apply for authorization to be able to issue, issue these plant passports. Plant Health will then process the application. Um, then they will normally inspect you um, to check that you're complying with the regulations and keeping the necessary records. Uh, this was done over the phone because of COVID, um, um, but normally there is an annual fee for this inspection. Uh, the plant passport, as most of, you, most of you probably know, has to contain four key pieces of information, the botanical name, um, your own registration number, a traceability code, as well as the country of origin. And then you need to keep all, all the records for, for, true, for full traceability. Lastly, uh, we also took the decision to set up a Dutch company um, so we could continue to import the bulbs that we buy in from Holland. We grow, uh, we buy a lot of our tulip bulbs um, through a Dutch bulb cooperative group called the CMB. And it was going to be extremely difficult to coordinate a phytosanitary certificate from all the different growers um, and then be responsible for, for all the paperwork. The CMB only acts as an intermediary, so they couldn't take responsibility. Um, so we dealt with the solicitor's accountants and, and Dutch Chamber of Commerce and so on to, to get a, a company in our name. Um, and we have representatives at the CMB who, who work with us on this and deal with the documentation uh, so that we can get the bulbs bulbs here that we had already bought and it it is working but it hasn't been it hasn't been hassle free uh, so we're still learning so what next um, well I've got to deal with the postponed VAT element um, so there's a change on the on the VAT return so I'll be working closely with my accountant to make sure that that uh, all the impact import VAT is dealt with correctly from April, the inspections will need to be paid for um, and the inspection rates and fees are published on gov.uk. In July, it's expected that all the inspections will take place at the port, so that should be um, less hassle um, and hopefully not too many holdups. And finally, from a grower's perspective, yeah, we will be looking carefully at the costs um, and we need to make our customers aware of it. It is time consuming and we're not, you know, we need to get to get a handle on how, exactly how much it is costing us because um, it's not insignificant um, and we, we do need to pass it back through, through the industry. So that's everything. Thank you very much. Thank you, Diane. Uh, as I said before, if you do have any questions for Diane, please submit them via the uh, the question submission box and we'll, we'll pick them up in the question and answer session in a moment. Now, just to pass over to uh, Victoria and Jason from uh, from DEFRA, who will be covering uh, plant importing, uh, exporting and plant passporting. Thank you. Thanks, Wayne. Um, yep. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Victoria Clark um, and I work on plant health import policy uh, following the under transition period. So new controls now apply to imports of high priority plants and plant products from the EU. High priority plants and plant products in the EU must have a phytosanitary certificate, a pre-notification submitted by the importer in England, Scotland, Wales on the relevant IT system, and that is currently PEACH until spring 21. Documentary, physical and identity checks. Goods classified as high priority include all plants of planting, ware and seed potatoes, some seeds and other plant forestry reprodu reproductive material, some wood and wood products and used agricultural machinery. A full list of high priority plants and plant products can be found on gov.uk. All other goods which are not on the high priority list are not currently subject to controls. OK, so between January and July 2021, goods classified as high priority will not be inspected at the border control post, but at places of destination, pods which are located inland away from the border. If you meet certain requirements this, uh, listed in the slide, you can register your premises as a, as a pod. 
and this includes consignments are sealed during transport to and storage at a pod the consignments and their packagings packaging are not tampered with or subject to alteration consignments remain at the pod until competent authority decides the goods can be released inspectors are provided with a safe demarc demarcated area on site to conduct their checks and that there are suitable uh, equipment to enable inspections to take place such as a table and a light source gb plant health services <coughs> will then undertake the checks at registered pods on a risk basis there is no limit to the number of pods that you can register but each premises will require a separate registration form and there is no limit also no limit sorry also no limit so how far the pod can be for the point of entry <coughs> while there is no deadline for uh, pod registration we are encouraging businesses to register as soon as possible and once your pod is registered with the relevant plant health service you will be able to select the pod during your pre-notification process to notify your gb inspector where the goods will be inspected and further details on the requirements of how to register as a pod can be found on gov.uk. Physical checks on EU high priority goods at place of destination will be conducted by the inspectors on a risk basis. This risk hierarchy provides an indication of the risk being applied to EU high priority goods list. For example, Plants intended for production of, or propagation or plants subject to national method, measures will be considered higher risk than finished plants. And so the physical inspection rate will reflect this. Service level agreements at place of destination. AFA, uh, for AFA, consignments can be inspected at registered places of destination, seven days a week, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. AFA will aim to inspect your consignment within four working hours of the time given for inspection by the importer as part of the pre-notification. In order for a service level agreement to apply, importers must provide pre-notification of, of import sorry, at least four working hours before the goods are landed into GB via RORO or air freight via the PEACH system. The importer should aim to provide as much pre-notification as possible as they are able to in order to receive a decision on whether a physical check will be required as soon as possible. In addition, the time given for inspection must be accurate. In the event that AFA are unable to inspect the goods within the four working hours, AFA will release the goods, but there will be some limited exceptions. For example, if there is an identified risk with a specific consignment, such as a recent, a recent interception of a harmful pest or disease having been made on the, plant, on the same plants from the same supplier, then those goods will be detained until an inspection has um, been carried out, even if that goes beyond the four hour window. There also may be cases where inspections are arranged outside the four hour window due to mutual agreement between AFA and the operator of the respective place of destination. AFA are providing a flexible service to uh, operations where possible to help manage demand, e.g. some out of hours coverage where resources allow. AFA regularly review their service standards provided at place of destination to make sure that it's fit, fit for purpose in order to facilitate trade. Um, Physical checks will be conducted at place of destination on a risk basis specific to uh, GB biosecurity objectives. Um, and just for completeness, um, I've included Forestry Commission uh, in there so where consignments will be inspected Monday to Friday, 9 a.m. till 5 p.m. And the Forestry Commission will aim to tell businesses if their goods had been, have been selected for inspection within three days of advance notification. Phase two of the import approach. Um, so new import requirements will start to apply on all regulated plants and plant products on high priority, uh, on plants and plant products, high priority plants will continue to be regulated. This phase will now include all plants supplanting, root 
and tubercle ve vegetables, some common fruits, other than those uh, preserved by deep freezing, cut flowers, some seed, leafy vegetables and other vegetables preserved for deep freezing and used agricultural machinery. You can check whether your plants and plant products you import from the EU are sub subject to plant health controls on the plant health portal. These goods must be accompanied by a phytosanitary certificate and pre-notified on the relevant IT system. During this phase, they will need to undergo documentary checks, but not identity and physical checks, unless they're on the high priority list, obviously. Um, original PCs will need to be posted to the relevant competent authority within three working days. As I said, documentary ID and physical checks will continue on high priority goods at places of destination. Phase three, um, we'll see um, all goods being subject to checks are frequency determined by the risk they pose um, at, um, at a BCP. All checks um, and all, there is a list of authorised BCPs can be found on gov.uk. And just the point on prohibited goods, some goods are currently prohibited from uh, GB from third countries as they pose a great risk to biosecurity. These pro prohibitions do not apply to plants and plant products imported from GB from the EU. Fees and charges. In, uh, so fees that will be applicable in England for the import inspection of high priority EU goods were planned to come in from April 2021. These have now been delayed uh, to the start of the 1st of June 2021. Um, and the other point on this slide is that there is no direct cost to registering at a place of destination, uh, uh, registering as a place of destination. However, there may be some set up cost to make sure that the pod meets the minimum requirements. So please check gov.uk um, for these requirements. IT systems, if you are importing plants and plant products to GB from January 2021 that are on the high priority list, importers must register on the PEACH system and the government gateway. And just to note, this is obviously an importer action. Um, once registered, importers will be able to use the PEACH system to make pre-notification and track the progress of their consignment. Pre-notification of goods on the relevant IT system will be required prior to arrival. And its pre-notification is four hours if imported by air and roll on, roll off port, and one working day by all other modes of transport. The PEACH system will be changed into a new IT service in spring 2021. Until then, importers should continue to use the PEACH system to make pre-notifications. Importers will be contacted to register on the new service before the change. And further guidance on how to register and use the new IT system will be provided soon. So I'll now pass over to Jason, who will cover exporting. No worries, and thank you very much, Vicky, and thank you everyone for um, inviting me along just to give a brief presentation on both exports and then on sort of plant transporting. So, Vicky, if you wouldn't mind moving to the next slide. Um, so, unlike uh, imports where there was a sort of phased introduction of, of controls, obviously exporting to the EU, for want of a better word, there was a, a hard start from the 1st of January, which effectively meant that any plants or plant products that uh, were regulated by the EU need a phytosanitary certificate. Again, obviously the goods that require a phytosanitary certificate uh, is the majority of uh, plants and plant products, so fruit, veg, plants for planting, etc. And sort of the bulleted list there on the slide shows you uh, the main commodity groups that will require a PC. Um, the link on this page also highlights where the EU keeps all of their relevant information in relation to what their plant health controls are. So please do visit that link and have a look around. They do signpost to the relevant pieces of legislation, although admittedly, like you say, it will take a little bit of deciphering uh, to get exactly the requirements that you need. Uh, one thing that I would like to highlight is that if you are 
exporting goods to the EU, you will need to do some form of a pre-notification on the EU's import system known as Traces NT. But the point I want to stress is that as a GB operator, you will be unable to register to be able to do that import pre-notification. So if you will only be able to do that if you are either the EU importer or a customs agent acting on their behalf. And so that's one point that I really just wanted to stress there. Um, obviously, if you are exporting to Northern Ireland, moving products there, then you will also need to register for Traces NT. If you wouldn't mind moving over to the next slide, Vicky? So in terms of what goods don't require a PC, unfortunately, it's a very short list. Um, so it's the five fruit uh, located there in the bulleted list. Uh, so effectively, everything else does need a phytosanitary certificate. Um, one point that I think, uh, again, I'd like to highlight is just around which goods are currently prohibited. And there are roughly two areas uh, that this covers at the minute. Uh, one is in relation to the Annex 6 prohibitions in uh, EU implementing Reg 2019-2072. And I'm sure that's the one that probably most of you are au okay fait with in regards to this is where the seed potatoes prohibition uh, is kept. So obviously, uh, conversations are ongoing at the minute in regards to looking to see whether we can gain equivalence in that aspect. However, there is another area around um, prohibited plants, and that pertains to the high-risk plants. Um, so these are particular genera of plants that cannot be exported to the EU until an information dossier is submitted by the competent authority in the exporting country, so in this case DEFRA, which highlights all the mitigations uh, that have been put in place to mitigate plant health risks associated with that particular commodity. Um, so for want of a better word, it's, it's basically a market access request. And um, again, the thing to highlight here is that uh, this particular process isn't a quick moving process. So even with submitting the, the, the dossiers, et cetera, uh, the EU Commission are only just starting to approve countries onto uh, for prohibiting particular goods now. So I think it would be a for me to say that this is a quick process and it's likely to take a matter of uh, what in scope of a year as opposed to months. Um, so until those dossiers have been assessed, um, you will be unable to export those particular goods. Um, within the text on that slide as well, it's just highlighting the two dossiers at the moment that we're working with in conjunction with stakeholders. And again, we really need your input on this one um, because quite a lot of the, the work and excellent work that you do do will need to be categorised and recorded to show the, the work that you do to mitigate the plant health risks. So if you are exporting sort of any of the high risk plants in particular to begin with the Malus and Prunus, um, please do get involved in sort of being able to help us to pull that information together. So until those dossiers are approved, you are unable to export those particular genera. So move on to the next slide, please, Vicky. Um, again, another element to highlight is wood packaging material. So if you are moving any of your plants and plant products uh, on pallets or any wood packaging material, if you're moving it into uh, the EU or NI, it will need to be ISPM 15 compliant and ensure that it's got the heat treated uh, stamp on there. Um, this is internationally sort of recognised and sort of a common occurrence for it for international trade. Um, and we've been working quite closely with the Forestry Commission on this one, as well as the, the providers to ensure that there is enough capacity there to be able to issue compliant uh, WPM. Um, obviously, it's something to highlight here is that if you do send um, plants or plant products on non-compliant material, then you do run the risk of the goods either being rejected at the border, but more likely uh, is that the goods will be moved onto compliant material, but obviously there may be surcharges associated with that. So the link on this particular page takes you to Tim Con, sort of the industry representative on the wood packaging uh, material, who can provide you with um, businesses who are able to provide sort of ISPM compliant material. Uh, moving on to the next slide, Vicky. Um, another scheme that's in place for exports at the minute, and I appreciate this may not cover all of you, but if you are exporting uh, fruit, vegetables, or cut flowers, then you may be eligible of as part of the Plant Health Exports Audited Trader Scheme, otherwise known as FEATS. So this scheme was put together to um, help facilitate exports of high frequency uh, exports of fruit, veg and cut flowers. 
by delegating the phytosanitary inspection to a competent person within the trade who's had sufficient training and uh, has been able to meet the requirements of that particular scheme. So if you do export any of those particular uh, goods, then uh, I'll be moving on to a slide a little bit later on that will provide you with a link on the plant health portal where you can do a little bit of reading up that goes into the different elements of seats, uh, so bits around the inspections, audits, fees, etc., and how to register um, your interest in that. Um, so that will apply for any exports to the EU and uh, Northern Ireland. Uh, moving on. Again, this is just the links with some useful information on, uh, which highlights our gov.uk page in terms of where you can find both imports and exports information, but also the plant health portal where we publish gui guidance in relation to um, importing and exporting after the 1st of January to the EU. And as I just mentioned, the plant health portal webpage. There's also the link to TIMCOM and the border operating model. So with the phases that uh, Vicky has just described there, it's a rather large document, but it does include uh, lots of information that goes beyond just the phytosanitary aspect. So it includes uh, sanitary CITES controls, uh, as well as sort of customs procedures, et cetera. So please do read uh, that if you haven't already. And again, the EU's webpage. I think one final thing just to highlight on the export side is that, if you are sort of applying for an exports application is ensuring that when um, the inspector is coming to have a look at your goods for export, is ensuring that all the goods are, are ready and available uh, for inspection. Because as, as I think the pressures are on all industries at the minute is the time pressure uh, sensitivities is that there are a lot of uh, export applications that inspectors will need to, to look at at the minute. So as a business, if there's anything that you can do to ensure that you have the commodities ready for inspection when the inspector turns up, this will obviously increase sort of the productivity and the efficiency of being able to issue the PCs and getting the inspections done. So again, just a, a note for yourselves there. So that brings the export side uh, to a close and just moving on to, to plant passporting. Um, so if you just move on again onto the next slide is obviously um, with us leaving the EU, well, uh, having left from the 1st of J January, is that we are no longer under the EU's SBS uh, zone. Um, so it's meant that we have moved to a UK plant passporting regime as opposed to the EU one. The good news is that obviously the scheme is broadly the same, and uh, Diane earlier touched on a, a couple of point, points in regarding the format of uh, the plant passports. What the major thing here is, is obviously that if you are moving goods to the EU or Northern Ireland, it means that you can no longer do this under a plant passport as EU plant passports or UK plant passports for that instance are not recognised uh, for moving into uh, the EU and generally speaking EU plant passports aren't recognised within uh, the UK but I will talk to that a little bit more shortly. Um, so again moving on to the next uh, slide is, and Diane did cover this a little bit, but again, I just wanted to highlight some of the slight changes that have been in terms of the format of the plant passport. And I'm going to talk to a couple of these sections as well, just to highlight some key points. So, whereas compared to the EU plant passporting system, there will be no flag on the UK uh, plant passports in the top right hand corner. And the word plant passport has been replaced by the word UK plant passport. Section A, in terms of the botanical name, has remained the same. But section B will no longer have the GB ISO code affixed to it at the front. And um, the main reason for this uh, before was just so that it can differentiate between uh, the member states. But obviously, that's not particularly necessary anymore. Section C, in terms of the traceability code, will also uh, remain the same. And I'm going to touch upon both section D and E uh, shortly, talking about um, country of origin, uh, when and when it changes, and then obviously qualifying Northern Ireland goods as well. So moving on to the next slide, where we're going to cover uh, the country of origin side of things. And this is about when you can designate GB as uh, the country of origin of those particular goods. And there is uh, guidance available on gov.uk, but generally speaking, it means once the plants have been grown on and there's certain conditions, uh, such as being repotted, replanted, and if grown under protection or outdoors for a certain period of time, once you've fulfilled that particular criteria, you can designate your goods as GB origin. There are a couple of notable exceptions though, and that's listed on this slide here uh, in regards to both Xylella and 
plain wilts in that if you bring those goods in, they must be in the UK for a whole year before you can list them as GB origin. The key thing to note here is that you can still market them if it's within that year, but obviously you cannot say that on the plant passport that they are of GB origin. Uh, so this particular policy applies uh, across the whole of the UK, including Northern Ireland. Moving on to the next slide, this will be talking about uh, qualifying Northern Ireland goods. So that if you are an operator based in Northern Ireland, moving plants and plant products, um, plants and planting rather into uh, GB, you can uh, do this under an EU plant passport if the goods uh, meet the criteria of a qualifying Northern Ireland good. Uh, again, there is guidance on the plant passporting page as to what is covered uh, as a qualifying Northern Ireland good. But broadly speaking, there's two elements one around um, that it's under free circulation in Northern Ireland, not under custom supervision. And the other one being that if it has moved into Northern Ireland, uh, sort of an undergone a processing operation under the inward process uh, procedures, which is customs uh, procedure, um, then you are eligible for the qualifying Northern Ireland good and the goods can move into uh, UK with the EU uh, plant passport. Obviously, um, there is a couple of exceptions here listed in points A and B, in that if you split the consignment down or choose to, as yourself, to uh, replace the plant passport with a UK one, uh, so for example, to include your supplier's details as opposed to perhaps the, the EU ones on there, uh, then you can issue a UK uh, plant passport. Um, just moving on to the next slide. Um, obviously, when you are replacing it under that scenarios, two scenarios I've just mentioned there, then within section E that we covered earlier on, you'll be required to put GBNI in part E. Uh, the main reason that we're asking for this uh, particular statement to be put in section E is to help aid with the monitoring compliance of plant passporting requirements in that it will enable us to identify that the goods uh, have originated outside of the GB's phytosanitary zone and they may not have undergone the full third country checks um, that would have been required as if it was a normal import. So as I'm sure we can all appreciate that in the event of any sort of pest outbreaks, this particular bit of information will be extremely useful uh, in, order, uh, in order to sort out sort of trace back activities. Um, so moving on to the next slide. Um, is talking about if the phytosanitary status of that uh, Northern Ireland good changes, then you can issue a UK uh, plant passport. So there's three uh, examples there that if the traceability is not being maintained, or if there is a pest or disease issue with the consignment, or the plants have been grown on, obviously going back to the criteria I mentioned earlier on, then you can issue a UK plant passport without the need to fill in Section E. So Section E can be left blank if you get it in from the EU and you do any of those three things there, you can issue a UK plant passport without filling in Part E. Again, all of this information is available on gov.uk on the plant passporting page, so I do recommend uh, you go ahead uh, and read that. Um, Moving on to the next slide, we'll just show you a quick uh, images of what the plant passports will look like. So the image on the left is the UK plant passport with the one on the right being the UK PFA plant passport. And moving on to the next slide is I'm just gonna quickly cover the requirements around uh, the PFA plant passports. So when we were part of the EU, um, the EU designated uh, uh, and GB did designate uh, protected zones. Um, these are sort of an EU concept and we've moved to the more internationally recognised term of pest-free areas. Obviously with uh, the UK being an island we had quite a lot of protected uh, zones from particular pests which have now moved into being sort of quarantine pests uh, because they are not present in the UK. However there is one notable exception in that um, oak processionary moth is present in the UK so if you are removing hosts of that particular pest in and around uh, the UK in and out of the PFA then you'll be required to issue that second type of plant passport around the PFA. 
Uh, the good news being is that actually nothing has really changed in that respect in that you still need to have the scientific name of the test or the appropriate EPO code is up to you uh, in terms of which ones you put. Um, so that's the only PFA um, plant passport that is required at the moment. Um, and I think that should bring me to the end of the plant passporting element. Um, so I will pass over back to Wayne. Thank you, Jason. If I if I can ask all speakers now and also the people taking part in the question and answer session to uh, put on their mics and uh, webcams, please, so we can see you all. Uh, I've had a few questions come in as we've been talking, but please, uh, if, if you do have a question, please, now is your chance to submit it and, and I can pose it to the appropriate person. Uh, we did have one or two pre-submitted questions, so I will commence with one of these. Uh, which uh, is, is a question about inspecting young plants and inspecting uh, mature plants. Uh, apparently, uh, un under current uh, policy, 100% of young plants and bulbs for planting are inspected at nurseries, at a cost of around £200 for consignment after April. Uh, fully grown plants for retail uh, are harder to inspect by their nature. Uh, considering this, uh, AFA are only checking around 10% uh, on £25 per load of a uh, of, of a um, sort of retail load. Um, how, how, how is this policy either logical or, or given uh, an 80, well, a, a, a large difference? Is, is it deemed to be a, a level playing field? We did have a similar question as well, just asking about whether, um, consider, considering these young plants have been coming in uh, pre-Brexit as well, whether it's a bit over the top to sort of uh, inspect every young plant. So with that in mind, if I can if I can perhaps ask Vicky to make a start and then perhaps uh, ask for a comment from Guy as well on that one. It's basically about a discrepancy between young plants and, and mature plants and the relative cost of, of inspecting each. Yeah, um, so in response to that, the, well, th those questions, uh, the fees that, that will be applicable in England uh, for imports inspections of high priority EU goods were planned to come in in April. So the first bit of good news, I suppose, is that these have now been delayed to the start of the 1st of June. So that was as of last week, I think that was communicated. Uh, the frequency of checks is based on the risk of the goods posed by GB Biosecurity. Um, plants which are used uh, for professional propagation, multiplication and commercial production pose the greater risk pose a greater risk than finished plants uh, intended for retail and this is largely due down down bleh, I can't get my words out this is largely down to the risk of introducing and spreading harmful pests and disease i.e they can be a super spreaders um, so the frequency of checks reflects that uh, differing risk and that also has a knock-on effect to the impact of physical inspection and the inspection fees which are set out proportionately to the frequency of the checks applied. Um, so I don't know if Guy wants to add anything further to what I've just said. Yeah, actually, I'll just uh, picking up on your last point, Vicky, just to make clear to everybody, the, uh, I think the original uh, question raised the issue of the grossly different levels of charging. <laughs> just to make clear that, that all consignments are charged, whether they're not, they're in, well, will be charged from June, whether they're inspected or not. So, as Vicky said, if it's subject to a reduced level of checks, say 10%, all of that type of material coming in will be charged 10% of the normal fee, whether or not it's inspected, just to make that point. Um, it was also asked about, you know, um, given that this material wasn't inspected last year, is it reasonable to inspect it this year? <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. That's very much part of our requirement to abide by WTO rules. Mm -hmm. So really we should be applying the same standards of biosecurity control to material from all countries. And we shouldn't really have um, different levels of control from EU member states just because it's convenient for us because they're ex -EU, they were EU member states. So we've had to sort of recognize WTO rules of, of fairness and level playing fields. And so introduce a level of check on EU material as well. And, and finally, I suppose just to, to enlarge on the, the sort of risks and, and why we target this propagating material, as Vicky said, it's that sort of super spreader thing that if you introduce it into production systems, 
you can get a vastly uh, bigger outbreak that is then distributed to a much greater range of premises. So, so it's deemed that the risk pathway is, is that much greater. So I hope, Wayne, that sort of expands on that a bit. But you're welcome Thank to come you. back on me if you want. Thank you for that, Guy. Thank you, Vicky. Um, if, I, if I take the remaining questions which have been submitted in chronological order, uh, one of the first to come in was actually for Diane. So, Diane, uh, the question is, uh, in, in Diane's opinion, what is the, well, it's two questions, actually. In Diane's opinion, what is the, uh, uh, what is the main challenge with trading with the EU now? And what key change would she want to sort of see to help overcome this? And then what opportunities does she see in the future? Um, well, the key challenge is is just uh, making sure you're doing everything correctly so things don't get held up, um, which is, you know, we're, we're proving that that is possible, you know, able to do that. Um, I think there is quite a challenge for plant health to get out to each farm within this four hour window. Um, you know, we're only at the start of the year. Um, you know, we're going into a busier and busier time. And, you know, they're saying they're going to start to, to inspect 100% of everything coming in. Um, then I'm concerned that they're not going to be able to get round to us in time. Um, one of the key things that at the moment is, is difficult is on the peach system you put when it arrives into port. You have an opportunity to put the comments in as to when it arrives on farm, but the plant health inspector can't see when it's going to arrive on farm. So it'd be quite useful if we could get that information to the plant health inspector so he knows roughly. I mean, we don't know when the lorry's going to wrap up, but we have a probably a better idea than 4 a.m. to Felixstowe is wildly different from when it's going to arrive at Kings Lynn in Norfolk. Um, and that at the moment, that information isn't able, we're not able to get that to the plant and health um, inspectors. Okay, from July that should all change. So hopefully that hurdle will, will you know, resolve itself in time. Um, yeah, I mean the cost, the cost is going to be you know, a big part of it. Um, there's no doubt costs for our exporters um, in terms of they've got to get everything inspected there and through customs. We've got to get it through customs here, and we know the haulier is being held up. So in in time, they're going to pass that those costs back to to us, um, as well as you know, like I say, the the, the customs cost for us um, and the plant health inspections. Opportunities? Well, I'm just seeing challenges at the moment and facing those day by day. Um, all I can say is I think we're going to end up consolidating quite a lot. Um, I think it's going to be harder for the smaller growers. Um, and I think we're going to have to just fill up the lorries um, and, 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 you know, and, and, and think about it logically in that way. I hope that helps. Thank you, Diane. Uh, Guy, would you like to sort of comment on any of those points, perhaps? Yeah, actually, I, I, thank I, you. I, I saw you. I saw you. I saw you nodding there in one or two instances. So I'll, I'll, I'll learn not to do that in future. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, absolutely, Diane. I take your point about this problem that that Peach actually asks for the the time that it arrives at the UK border, uh, and that came about because unfortunately we had to develop this system fairly quickly um, towards the end of last year, and we had to reuse parts of existing systems, and that was an existing question. We've put in a change request to get that change to be estimated time of arrival at the pot. So hopefully yeah. that, that will address that. And I'm sorry it's taking so long to get through the system, but we, we have releases on Peach that are programmed in and, and you can't pull them in advance of that. Um, and coming back to your, I think, very real concerns about the workload on the inspectorate. I think the important thing to remember, and we're encouraging all inspectors to do that, is make sure, particularly with newer contacts, they establish good communications because the inspector is, is very much able to decide upon the risk of the plant material coming in. And if they discuss with you as the grower that, that you know, it's arrived at nine o'clock today, but it's going to stay on your premises, they could well say to you, oh, that's all right, we'll release it now, but I'll come along tomorrow to inspect it. So uh, the key thing is that we are controlling this material. We're inspecting as we see fit according to risk. But hopefully, and it appears you have this already with good communication between uh, growers and their local PHSI, the inspections can be arranged at sort of mutual, most efficient times. Thank you, Guy. Again, you're uh, welcome to come back to me if you want to pick up on anything beyond that. 
in a similar vein, I have a question regarding uh, customs and, and Peach again. Uh, the question is, if I use a customs agent to notify Peach on, import, on an import, I assume place of destination is at the port. Do I need to arrange inspections or is this done at the port and therefore do I need to send a packet of sanitary certificate to Peach? Okay, shall I pick up on that, Victoria? I didn't know if Louise wanted to come in. Did you want to oh, say anything on that one? Sorry, I don't want to put you on the yeah. spot. <laughs> No, so I'll do a brief intro and then Guy, if I'm missing anything, please do step in. Um, so yeah, you, you're completely correct. Um, more than able to use a customs agent. That doesn't necessarily mean that you have to have your um, official control on that high priority good done at the port. That option is available to you. Um, so when we developed the place of destination scheme, um, you know, for the, for the first six months as a result of the border infrastructure not being fully in place yet we developed it to give importers and traders as much flexibility as possible for the most part having your inspections done at a place of destination is the preference but we do recognize that for some you know a small number of importers there was that um, appetite to have the inspections done um, at the port but if you do choose to use a customs agent and you don't want to have your inspection done at the port that is possible what your customs agent would have to do is um, basically get um a, apply for a pod registration to link their um their docker number within the peach system to link their sorry their um, client reference number sorry within the system to the place of destination of the of, of the customer that the the inspection will be done at so that that link can be built in the system so that when the agent applies for a pod inspection on your behalf or on the importer's behalf they can um they can select that place of destination don't know guy if you've got anything more to add no, to that i think you said it all louise yeah absolutely <laughs> Okay, uh, sticking with Peach, and, uh, another question possibly for Diane or Guy. Um, in Peach, we, we enter the time that the plants will arrive on the nursery rather than the port. Is, is that correct? Well, I have to say that that's, that's yes, that's funny enough, the question doesn't ask you that, but that is the answer we actually want in that field. So, um, again, it comes back to as long as there's good communication and the inspector. I suppose to be perfect, the, the grower should just make sure the inspector knows that they're aware of that's the uh, information we need and that's what they're entering on the system. Because I suppose what we wouldn't want is the inspector assuming that that actually is the time it's arriving at the port and therefore arrives too late. I hope I haven't uh, overanalyzed that answer, but in essence, yes, that is the information we need. It's the time of arrival at the pod. Okay, and is, is that your take on it as well, Diane? Well, reading that I've been actually putting on Peach the time of arrival into port because that's yeah. specifically what it asks you on Peach. And then I put an additional comment down the bottom that it's going to a pod and what time it's available at the pod. Okay. So that's I how suppose, I do. Yeah. I suppose in a perfect world, when you first make contact with the inspector, have that conversation and 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 agree with the inspector that you understand the best information to give is time of arrival in the at the pod, and that's what you'll be doing. But as Diane says, unfortunately, if you don't have that conversation, the inspector might think it is the time it arrives at the port. It is down to, I'm afraid, the wrong uh, uh, label on, on that field on, on Peach. I must admit, we have we have good we've got two two inspectors now that we uh, liaise with, um, so they they know pretty much the nature of, of of what's going on. So we 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 will email them, text them, whatever, and make them aware of roughly when we're going to expect it on on farm, and then usually follow it up and say, right, it's here now, and they'll they'll then turn up within the next hour or so. It's really great to hear that you've got that good communication with the inspectors. I think just to add, I think there's two points on it really, just to add on what Guy said. The first part is that unfortunately we are working through Peach updates at the moment. Um, so that hopefully that clarity will come soon in that field. Um, but again, you know, we are operating in um, interesting times at the moment and the pre-notification requirement itself, when it's set out in legislation, is that you would provide, um, you know, for roll on roll off rate, four hours advance notice or for things coming from air freight, four hours advance notice. And that legislative requirement is actually for the goods landing in the UK, obviously with the place of destination scheme, because it is a short term contingency measure to you know to adapt to the new regime and until the border infrastructure is in place we've had to make some compromises on yeah on, on how that's implemented but that 
it's originally there in the system being set as the time of arrival at the port because that pre-notification requirement applies to when the goods first land in Great Britain. So I hope that helps and provides a bit more context as well. Yeah. Okay, um, just sticking with Peach, perhaps one for Victoria here. Regarding the new system to replace Peach, do we have a more definitive date than spring? I'm afraid not at the moment. <laughs> yeah, that's the, the line that we're using. I'm afraid at the moment it's spring 2021, but just to reiterate what I said earlier, importers um, and businesses will be um, notified when they need to change over to that. And, 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 and once that is uh, sort of communicated, there will be uh business uh readiness seminars and stuff like that to that people can join to so they can understand the new system and stuff so that will be communicated in due course okay uh thank you and and sticking with dates uh, another date here is the first of july date for all checks to take place at the border guaranteed there is some concern this target will not be met uh that's a very good question and a very topical one at the moment there are some uh live discussions going on at the moment um, and we will communicate some more stuff soon. It's a very short Hi. answer I'm afraid so I've got just nothing look. else to say. <laughs> okay just looking to see if we've got any more. Um, uh, Wait. It's, sorry Ed. I, yeah, it's, I was just going to follow up on some of the, the comments around imports. Um, I, I realise I do plant passporting and exports predominantly, but you know one of the, th the areas that you know I would always look back upon as well in the communications and from what Diane was just saying as well is is around working with the inspector. And obviously, for some of the sectors, you've got goods pre-planned by week. So you, you, as Diane was explaining, you know how much is coming in on you know which weeks and probably almost to which day so you've got stuff pre-planned in and, and you communicate that with the inspector as well work with them so they can they can help liaise and work a bit more closely with, with yourselves uh, and that'll give a bit more longevity maybe from the short into the, into the medium term too uh, as well as as working on you know as doing the actual practical entries through peach okay uh thank you ed uh, we've got a question here about phytosanitary certificates. Uh, if there's going to be 100% inspection in the UK, uh, why do we have to sort of pay for a phyto certificate in Holland? Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, it's, it's a question of auditing and validation. Uh, and I, I think I'm right that it's, uh, again, one of these sort of international standards that, that those certificates are issued. Uh, and and we accept that they're issued to to an ish, international standard. Uh, part of the routine phytosanitary control, I think, of all countries is then to to verify that that certificate is correct for the condition particular conditions of the UK upon entry. Uh, and so it is that you know, that check on the certificate. Okay, thank you, Guy. Yeah, uh, just and, just to sorry. yeah, like you say, sorry, Wayne. Just to build on what Guy was saying there, yeah, it's very much to attest that the the goods have met the import requirements. And um, like you say, we do unfortunately come across instances where, like say, the phytosanitary certificates may not be correct, and obviously have to take appropriate action to turn like, based on that. So yes, I appreciate, like you say, you would have to get the inspection in the Netherlands, and they're issuing the the PC to attest that the goods meet the GB import requirements. But the checks in GB are very much to validate that that consignment has met the import requirements in, in GB. Okay, uh, we've got a question here about service level uh, and what can we expect when inspections are done at the, at the port in terms of time from arrival to being released back into the, onto the road? Would anybody like to sort of tackle that one? So I don't know if Guy wants to comment, but my understanding is that this is being considered at the moment in terms of what our service level agreements will be at BCPs. Um, there might be different service level agreements at different ports, depending on how busy they are, and uh, and also in terms of we're developing these inland uh, border control posts as well for the short straits. So there will, uh, which which may well have 24-hour service. So it will be different. It will be different. Um, service levels for different um ports i would i would imagine but i don't know if guy wants to add any more to that what i've just said 
I suppose I'd put the general perspective, which I hope is good news for yourselves in the trade, is, is that there's a, a very significant encouragement that, that our primary objective is biosecurity, but that must be done uh, with, with a, a very key aim, more so facilitating trade. trade. trade and yeah. so, you know, the, <clears throat> fortunately, the, there is a, an appetite from government to, to recruit staff where necessary to have extensive cover out of normal working hours in order to, to meet the demands of trade. So essentially, there's been a lot of modeling done on the trade patterns and, and volumes going through these potential points of entry. And uh, as Vicky says, that, that they will be resourced to meet the demands of the trade, maintaining a level of biosecurity. That's much more eloquently put than I put. Thanks, Guy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Guy. Um... A question back here for, for Diane. Uh, is it possible to please ask Diane how many hours approximately per week additional admin work uh, they are doing now to meet all the challenges they're dealing with? Um, I would say I've spent probably half a day on it, maybe a bit less. Um, and that's probably at the moment we've got four loads coming in. Yeah, probably, I, I would yeah, probably half a day is a bit much, but it, it it would take me half an hour per consignment probably to make sure I've got all the documentation, um, upload it and so on and so forth. And that's without then liaising with the plant health, that takes a bit of time as well. So yeah, it's not it's not insignificant. Okay, and following on from that, we, we've had one or two questions about the level of paperwork. Uh, and so the follow on question, I guess, either either to uh, Guy, Ed, or, or Jason, or, or Vicky, what 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 are the processes? What what what? Uh, sorry, what are the plans to sort of streamline the processes and make better use of technology to reduce the overall cost to importers? Posting certificates in, uh, seems crazy in 2021. So mm -hmm. a, a, ge a general question about making it more streamlined, reducing costs, and reducing the admin load. Um, yeah. So uh, sorry, I... go on, go on, Jason. Okay, cheers, Vicky. Um, so, no, I think there's a, there's a couple of elements here that we can look at. And I mean, obviously, the, the first one Vicky's already mentioned around the new IT systems coming in, in the obviously that like you say they'll be designed to be a little bit more up to date than the current sort of peach and edomero so it'll be a lot more user friendly uh, on that side but in terms of where we're looking to uh, move towards in the not too distant future is looking at the implementation of sort of electronic certification so obviously being able to transmit the phytosanitary certificates in a secure manner between uh, the different plant health organizations uh, around the world um, Obviously, there is a, an international system already known as eFito. So we are currently looking at sort of what we need to implement in sort of the newer IT systems, because I'm sure, as you can appreciate, there there isn't much point in sort of updating the older IT systems because they're they're not long for this world, so to speak. Um, but that's very much a, a movement that we're looking towards. So we'd be able to provide um, instant transmission of certificates straight to the so the plant health authorities in Northern Ireland, Republic and sort of other EU member states. And like you say, the safeguards then come with that particular type of movement as well is that it, it lessens the chance of sort of any sort of fraudulent activity, but also gives you reassurance as well that the certificates are, have been made it to where they're supposed to be in good time. And equally, like you say, with the fact that if there were any replacement certificates required, then all it is required is for the uh, APHA to issue a new one and that can be in transmitted straight away as well so there's there is quite a lot of benefits uh, to the electronic transmission through eFito so again we're hoping that in the not too distant future uh, we'll be able to uh, move the certificates rather than having the original paper-based certificates one thing that obviously that does need to happen is before any exchange can happen there needs to be a bilateral agreement between the two countries to be able to uh, accept these particular certificates. But as I'm sure you're aware, any countries that are currently operating it uh, would be more willing uh, to sort of sign up to that particular uh, arrangement. So that's a couple of them. I don't know if there was any points anybody else uh, within the board wanted to highlight. If I could just add a couple of things, uh, almost to make clear that eFito isn't just a scanned paper copy. It's, uh, it, it's sending the data as a data string. And as soon as you do that, 
it means you can capture the data and feed it into other databases. So that will prevent the need for importers to declare all the individual genuses coming in on their consignments because that has been declared as a data string on the FITO. So it will reduce the amount of effort in Diane entering her peach entries. Um, it will also mean that we can automate the document checks to some degree, which will make the whole process faster and cheaper because there'll be a degree of ma machine reading of that data to validate it rather than a person. So that's on the sort of document side, but also I think I'm right overall, as we enter this new world of, of the flow of EU material coming to the UK, because previously we had passporting and therefore no real immediate knowledge of the patterns of trade, as this develops, we'll get a better understanding of the patterns of trade, the risk pathways, and so we'll be better able to target high risk material and there'll be less control on low risk material, which again will make the whole system that much more uh, efficient and, and risk targeted. And then finally, I would just mention it always sits in the background and I think Vicky may know a bit about this, I don't know, one government at the board, this concept of, of actually unifying a lot of the import systems and even some of the import processes on the ground at the border. So you have a, a single um, uh, integrated border controls rather than different agencies all looking at individual areas, which again may make things more efficient. That's a very much a long term aim though. Any any further comments from anybody else on, on that matter? I think it, it's to be honest, it's just picking up on what I said there is that DEFRA are very much sort of paving the way for that sort of one government element. So obviously we're looking at drawing um sort of the different areas within that DEFRA cover, so within whether it's products of animal origin or the uh, animal health search is using that same import and export system so that regardless of what you deal with um, you will sort of be okay with how the system works and how notifications need to be produced. I appreciate that obviously not everybody will have the crossover in using all those different particular systems but that's sort of one step uh, towards sort of like unifying and having a one sort of system approach to being able to notify particular goods within sort of the DEFRAS area. Okay, thank you, thank you, Jason. Uh, one one last question, then I've got for Sarah, so she doesn't feel left out of all this discussion. Um, with, is is the rules of origin likely to impact anything else beyond cut flowers? Do you think, in terms of uh, the uh, the ornamentals industry? Um, so this is fairly well covered in the in the presentations. Um, it, it is complicated, but um, in in Diane's case, if she's bringing bulbs in and they're being grown on then they uh, they qualify then for for uk originating so they will they they will count if you like so she's bringing in the material from the eu growing it on and exporting that won't fall foul of rules of origin um and 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 the same with plants um so plants and bulbs that are sufficiently grown grown on that that qualifies as the sufficient transformation um if if you like i think it's more um uh, if it's just simply repackaged or very simple um, processing that doesn't qualify for this sufficient processing. So so in, in my example, it was um, bunches of flowers that may not all originate from the UK if you've got more than 15% and they're going back out to say supermarkets uh, within the EU, then I think you need to be very careful. Um, but yeah, the, the devil is in the detail on rules of origin. But as I say, DEFRA have got some really, really um, clear webinars and, and clear guidance up there on their website. So if you Google DEFRA rules of origin, um, you will find uh, some very clear answers answers there on specific items because it does it will go on a sort of case by case. Thank you, thank you, Sarah. If if we can draw the question and answer session to a halt there, and perhaps if I can ask Heather just to sort of transfer control over me, just to sort of finalise with the uh, the wrap-up slides. I'll just like to sort of say a few things before we do um, uh, uh, draw, draw the the webinar to, to a close. Um, yeah, so, so just, to, just to sort of reiterate in terms of more information, there's another slide here which uh, reproduces and replicates the, the information that was within Jason's presentation. So please, if, if you do need to sort of seek further information after the webinar, that there are some useful uh, web, uh, web addresses there to sort of find more information, more expansive information on the topics we've covered today. And then just to, just to, just to wrap up, just to sort of thank all our presenters today, 
uh, Sarah, Diane, uh, Jason and Vicky, and for also for, uh, uh, for Ed, for Guy and for Louise for taking part in the question and answer session. Uh, we, we did have one or two issues with the, with the handout today in terms of being able to download. I think those have been rectified. So you have got a few more seconds if you want to sort of download the handout to make sure you have the slides to hand. So please do that now if you need it. Any further questions, please submit them to me and we'll pass them on directly uh, to the presenter and, and get the information back to you. As I said before, the recording will be made available later uh, this week or perhaps early next week on the HDB website. Uh, and then just look out for future HDB horticulture webinars. Uh, as Sarah mentioned before, we, ha we have the second EU exit webinar uh, next uh, Tuesday, 19th of March at the same time. So please uh, look to join us there. And then uh, in April, we've got a series of IPM webinars for, for all of horticulture. So thank you for joining us for this session and, and good luck with the 2021 growing season. Thank you very much. <laughs>